Thank you for having us. And my name is Ava Diaz. I'll be moderating the panel. I teach at Pratt in the um, History of Art and Design department. And I recently finished the manuscript to a book called After Spaceship Earth, about the legacy of Buckminster Fuller in contemporary art, of which the last part of it is about the privatization of space, um, different um, models of ecological injustice um, and seeking justice that artists have been pursuing. So it's my great pleasure to be on this panel and we'll have a, hopefully plenty of time for questions from the audience and um, you know, we'll have a chance to talk amongst ourselves too. Um, so I want to just introduce by name and then let them just give a word about um, who they are. Um, this is Agnes, um, and she, uh, well, you, <laughs> I'll just go down the line. Agnes, Tomas, Laurie, and Josh. So if you just say one sentence about who you are and where you're based. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm an artist working at the experimental edge of art, science, new technologies, old technologies, exploring the zone between fact and fiction. In 2003, I have founded a small institute called Research Raft for Subterranean Science, and its chief was mainly to explore subterranean phenomena, and I developed tools, tools to search, it's a whole work series to explore these. But then later, I, I expanded my research directions, I did a project in weightlessness also, and I, um, oh, microgravity, and I started to explore uh, phenomena inside Earth, but also outside Earth, and comparing the parallels in between. And I also renamed my institute into Research Raft Institute for Art and Subjective Science. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, he hello. 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 Yes, I'm uh, Thomas Rezino. I'm very happy to be here. And um, no, I think so. What? Uh, um, well, I, I come usually often here. I want to say thank you to Lila Kidney, uh, Caroline Jones, uh, this Paulo Suarez, a lot of friends, uh, Janet and um, Bill McKenna, and a lot of people which usually I, I visit and we see and we maintain conversations through the time when I come here. But uh, the time that I want to uh, spend here is uh, I have a lot of uh, sometimes troubles uh, with the other talks that uh, were before, and then one, I'm, I'm kind of just. Well, the exercise will be kind of a brainstorming of, of proposal and idea, and then the first proposal is like, you know, space at the moment is, or outer space, or whatever name you might say, it started at 100 kilometers high, right? It's when objects stop falling, and it's like, usually now they call it the Karanam line or something like this. I mean, I think so there is a lot of problem with, with, with where space starts and ends, and I think so we should kind of really, I think so one of the big things, and you know, the 100 kilometer threshold, you know, it's always a cultural interpretation. It was not always at 100. In one more, it's 200 and 300. Then 100 is, I mean, as a cultural negotiation with this constant. What I would try to kind of argue today is like a space. We are in space now. And I think so. And I think so. This uh, response ability, when we change where space starts and then I think so, will help us to facilitate the discourse in a kind of a different tone. That's kind of the first thing that I'm trying to, and I will try to think uh, together as an exercise today. Um, I'm Laurie Anderson, and I, um, I'm going to stick to the one sentence uh, thing. Uh, I, I'm an artist who works with stories in lots of different uh, media, and I'm interested in uh, right now in, in more of the things that have to do with studying nature of mind. And I'm Josh Simpson. I am a glass blower, a, a glass artist, and I have spent the last uh, nearly 50 years experimenting with uh, melting silica and uh, flux and, and uh, lime and putting them together, making glasses that are interesting and trying to make them into some object that is intriguing and interesting to look at. Thank you. So our brief um, in doing this panel was that um, each of the artists will present for about three minutes um, on their work, and then we can open it up. Um, I'll have some questions, and then we can open it up to the audience. So the order of the presentations will be first Agnes, and then um, Josh, then Tomas, and then finally Lori. So I think that we have the slides queued up, and if you go to... I don't know. Do yeah, I let's see. Aya. There you see. Okay, I will shortly introduce you to one very important and large department of my Institute for Art and Science, which is the Lunar Migration Bird Facility. 
existing th since 2008, and it's Mungus Colony, which is an ongoing long-term performance installation and movie. It's actually a method of private space traveling, which was for the first time mentioned in a book by English Bishop Francis Goodwin in the year 1603. However, the method that allowed the main character to travel to the moon was with the help of Mungis. So, and yeah, Mungis are very special migration birds who, like other uh, migration birds, travel annually towards the autumn from Spain to Africa, for example. They migrate annually from the Earth to the moon. And I was wondering, was, what happened to the Mungis in the 21st century? Does this special species still exist? Do they still know about their moon migration pattern or have they been stranded? Uh, how could we implement the idea of flying? Would it be a genetic awakening or an imaginative awakening experimentally? Did they ever fly to the moon really or do they still fly? So in 2011, I have actualized the concept of Francis Goodwin and I raised 11 moon geese from birth on a farm in Italy. And I teach them to become astronauts, to be able to fly to the moon with them one day. And first I named the eggs. All names are related to space travel history. Here you see the team. At, <laughs> it's an international team at the age of 11 days. We started with the astronaut training immediately after hatching. And yeah, for example, lessons on the space junk problem. And yeah, I will show you two or three methods very shortly out of many, many, many. But um, there is, yeah, it's, a, it's an ongoing long-term project. So there is here in, in the exhibition in front of the auditorium, there's the movie Mungus Colony. It's 20 minutes long and it documents the first year of astronaut training. So you can watch this. It's 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a look. Successful imprinters are not only able to teach the goslings where to sleep and to walk, what to eat, but also to fly, where to fly and how to get there. The V. After nine months of strenuous but successful training, we are back to the MGC home base, ready to start the next stage of the experiment. Okay, I want to uh, finalize now with some last remarks. It's a long-term mission. The first unmanned flight is planned for 2027 and the first manned flight for 2038. There have been already goslings born on our moon in Italy. We have built a large moon analog there. And so the Mungus colony is growing and the moon is getting closer and closer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, part of my talk has visual little photos, so I'm counting on this clicker working. Okay. So Glass is this amazing alchemic stuff that is just sand and, and even borax hand soap. And if you put those two together on a table, you're going to wait a long time for them to do anything. Um, but if you add 2,400 degrees of heat, they become this molten liquid that is almost impossible to deal with. It's crazy hot, and it drips and flows like honey. It possesses an inner light and transcendent radiant heat that make it one of the most frustrating and one of the most fascinating things for an artist to work with. And what inspired me originally was when I started to blow glass in 1971, I, this photograph, Bill Anders had taken this photograph just before in, in 68, 
And I was entertaining kids uh, who came to my studio, and I thought I should try making planets out of glass to give them something to think about. Small planets, they loved watching marbles, but thinking about making something that would make them uh, think about this world that we live on that seems so limitless and large is really just a small little blue marble in the black void of space. And so I began using gl different glass techniques. And, and what's challenging about glass is that it, it doesn't want to cooperate. It's just a molten liquid. It does not care about anything, really, except gravity and centripetal force. And so my trick is to put as much detail and as much interesting things and let people imagine cities or oceans or continents or large structures on these planets and wonder Perhaps it's uh, uh, an orbiting, uh, transiting exoplanet survey satellite that may discover them. What I've found over time is that these little worlds are fascinating to all kinds of different cultures and uh, races and, and different age groups. Everyone loves them. The other thing that I've been working on more recently is part of what I love about glassblowing is inventing new things. I really probably should have been a chemist or an engineer because I build my furnaces and I, and I work on these glasses. And most people who are chemical engineers working with glass are looking for certain optical properties or certain dielectric properties. I'm looking for color and I want to, that's a fire and you guys all know this photo. And, uh, but, but what I'm trying to do in my glass is make you think about something as cool as or as distant from us as these Hubble images. And um, so the idea is to have you think about something else somewhere in the universe, but also be intrigued with the detail that's in them. I've recently become interested in trying to display or depict a black hole. What would an accretion disk look like? And how can you make something that reflects light suck light in? And uh, this, is, this is my studio. This is my glass studio. I live and work across the driveway uh, from each other. And uh, this was last Thursday. And uh, this is in uh, warmer times. We just installed a uh, solar panel, so all the, it, the, the energy footprint of a glass studio is like a Sasquatch. It, it, I, um, but we are now making all the electric power that we use in, in the glass studio. And I have two more photos. One um, is, um, you will all meet my wife, Katie Coleman, later on this afternoon. I was making planets long before we met uh, through an accidental wrong number on the phone in 1990. Um, but um, but uh, here's one of my planets. This is another project called the Infinity Project to hide my planets around the world. And so this one um, is hidden in space. Thank you. Uh, Sit down right? because it's a bit awkward when we, I stand here and then you face it back and I try to get it here. Um, yes, um, it's three minutes I to go as fast. As <laughs> when breath becomes air, when, uh, when atmosphere becomes the movement of the post fossil fuel era against carbon capitalist cloud. Um, and then uh, let's say that, yes, if I cross the three minutes, uh, you just tell me and then. We will try to keep it in the Q and A. Um, okay. Today I landed by plane, collecting more points of shame on my golden card of carbon emission. For three minutes, I don't know how much carbon emission I put it really on this card. While fossil fuel-based industry try to colonize other planets, the air, the interface between us and the sun is controlled by few and continue to be compromised. Carbon emissions fill the air, particular matter float inside our lungs, 
And while electromagnetic radiation enveloped the earth, dictating the tempo of digital capitalism in the era of global warming. As we confirmed last month in Nature magazine, the constant rise of CO2 and other atmospheric pollutants disperse the tropospheric clouds, whose reflectivity helps to keep the balance of planetary temperature, leaving a forecast to up to 8 degrees Celsius. This means today, one of the things that I want to say is like, I feel when I see this rocket just bursting and putting up and you know, on the cost that it takes that, I think so, you know, the, when we were talking, what, what was the event or I don't know, the, the, the person who was sitting before about this, uh, this moment of change when you go up uh, and then you have this moment of, how it's called? The overview. The overview effect. I think so these are really encouraged. What is the next overview effect that we have to have, right? It's like when I got into the plane and I came up here, I think so I got a really bad overview effect. I got flowing over Iceland and then you see the glacier and you see the turbine of the jet. I mean, that's the not another overview effect that you have to get and what is the consciousness we have to get? I mean, do we still need to get up to the moon to get the reality of the planet that we are living today? And I mean, I think so. There is a problem over there. Okay, and then we go on to the Irocene, the, the epoch that we are trying to, to foster and to work together with some of the people that I mentioned before. With Irocene, we propose an epoch of interplanetary sensitivity, we bring a new ecology of practice, asking how we could breathe in a post-fossil fuel economy, and what is our responsibility to be on air. No? I like the split of the word, responsibility. What is your ability to respond to be today on air? And how we can change the social political joke, uh, um, geopolitical borders in the age of climate inequality. How to participate in a new epoch beyond the Anthropocene, forward the decarbonization of the air and toward the independence of fossil fuel. We propose a new epoch called the Aerosene. By promoting um, the scrutinized free access to the atmosphere and beyond through collective activities, sensitive experiences, cross-disciplinary discussion, and do it yourself uh, we open up these new spaces, again, the world spaces. Aerosine activate a common imagination to our new symbolic relationship with the air that we breathe. So, I mean, I will show a little bit what, what, are, what are these kind of the space agency that we are trying to, to bring up and how we can get into the air with, a, with this maybe ability to respond differently. In 2007, with a community of people around the world, we started collecting used plastic bags. It's very important to mention about the, the reusing. We cut them, we paste them, and we create in gigantic canvases. Mm. And when with canvas unite, bends, and fold, space is full of air is formed. And when the sun rises out, out of the horizon and the air heats up inside the space, the museum flies into the air. A fly museum that we call the Museo Solar. On this aerosolar journey, gravity becomes upturned, and instead of falling to the center of the Earth, we're falling into the universe. And this is why the way I brought a backpack, and tomorrow if it's a sunny day, I think so we could try to experience what is today to float in the air. And, and it's a backpack that you know, have been kind of uh, um, put up together with our friends and, and, and this community of Erosine. Uh, this means, uh, thanks to the heat of the sun that wore up the inside, the space which is inside, you know, it just got up into the air. And then, uh, well, it's obvious that we don't use fossil fuel batteries and all the kind of uh, carbon uh, capitalistic ideas of uh, extracting economy we have been doing towards the planet. And then sometimes we do a free fly. And this is the project that we have been doing with MIT that basically is, uh, was a collaboration with IPS, uh, with Ludovica Ilaria, Glenn, and uh, Bill McKenna, which some of them are here today. And uh, the thing is, like, uh, what, I, what we are trying to do is, like, if I will have take from Berlin uh, to arrive to Boston, uh, I should have take off 8.3 days uh, ago. Uh, I would just, uh, what it does, it just compute all the wind currents, which are kind of natural rivers of the wind. And once we learn how to float in the atmosphere, maybe then we can try to find a different equation of, uh, of our time in relationship with the ecology we're living. I think so I stopped there because it was a bit too long, but thank you. Thanks. Um, Steve, if you can hear me, we can uh, start the, the, uh, the video. We're just going to um, take a very quick uh, trip through a, a virtual reality uh, work that I just did called To the Moon. And uh, it was commissioned by um, 
the Louisiana Museum of Art, my favorite art museum in the world. It's just such a wonderful place in, near Denmark. And uh, they were doing a show about the moon. It starts out with uh, constellations that evaporate as you look at them, various ideas that used to be sort of permanently ensconced in the sky just become these temporary things. Um, dinosaurs, polar bears, bees, the word democracy. Uh, this dinosaur that through some uh, uh, DNA just uh, turns eventually into a car. So there were lots of stories of, um, originally with this work and like with a lot of um, projects that I work on, they they get uh, drowned in the media uh, that I'm working in, and you don't, and they just seem unnecessary. So, uh, a lot of this is much more about flying than stories. It became, it originated with um, a lot of uh, Im moon imagery and ideas about uh, the moon, and uh, it kind of went off in a in another direction. The context of the show was uh, lots of space gear and lots of theories and, and Galileo uh, um, uh, material, notebooks and you know, it was really a pretty beautiful show. I hope it, it travels. I think it's actually going to Norway. It just was there. So then you zoom down into this other whoops, fossil fuel thing. This of course is um, uh, just a, a recording of somebody's version of this. What I love about VR is, um, first of all, uh, that you can fly. And that's really uh, the most important thing in, in, in this, so that you, you go where you see. And I, oh, here's, we, this was a, scene was originally called Moona Lago. It was about uh, uh, <laughs> a lot of the debris and militarization of the moon, so there's a, a lot of stuff in there. Uh, there's little references to the little prince and all sorts of kinds of stories about the moon. Um, Fedorov was also uh, one of the original characters. We, it was also at one point a kind of Russian mystery about all the, using a lot of the Russian names on the dark side of the moon. Uh, but it comes down to everything that I've done uh, as an artist is about uh, disembodiment. And this is the greatest... Um, uh, technique at, at the moment for, for that. Although I think losing yourself, you can lose yourself in a Russian novel, you can lose yourself in a pencil drawing. VR, um, uh, this is one in which the volition just drops out for a minute and you're kind of forced to the top of this mountain where you fall and you lose your body and it is, it is terrifying. I couldn't resist the, the scene that's in every space movie of the astronaut just jumps out onto, uh, he goes out to make a repair and then of course his cable gets cut and he tumbles off into space. Um, this is a scene with the largest prime number and there's, this is the only uh, body imagery um, in this one. It, it ends with a kind of donkey ride on the moon and you're, you can <laughs> wave to yourself as you're, as you're riding along. Um, this was a reference to the lawsuit of the, that the Chinese brought to uh, international course a while ago saying that the Chinese own the moon. And of course the Russians um, said, uh, oh, we were there first. And you know, uh, the Americans go, no, 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 we put the first guy there. And the Italians go, we saw it first. <laughs> uh, who owns the moon? Anyway, um, that's it. How many time is up? <laughs> So this is a bit of an unfair question because actually Laurie has already answered it in the New York Times, but I wanted to ask you all about <laughs> Yusaku Mazawa's Dear Moon proposal and what you think about um, a tech e-commerce billionaire sending five to eight artists on a moon journey. He's the first SpaceX customer for the circumlunar voyage and we're in the kind of moment between maybe artist as pet or artist as being patronized by a patron, which is not a new moment. So maybe we could, would, would you go on that voyage? What do you think about that relationship of art to space at this moment? Um, I think wherever scientists go, or artists, uh, it's good when artists go as well. <laughs> Uh, art has many functions, so it's uh, though for me it's important that it stays free. It doesn't need to be aiming at uh, at the result, but um, 
it opens up perspectives. It's just supporting uh, other views and uh, art forms culture. So it's a human condition, art, that art explores our world as well. Thomas? No, but it's what I said before. I think so. It's, it's all the time. I mean, this rhetoric question, will you go to Mars? You will go to the moon. Will you, at which cost? You know, I mean, this, I mean, I think so. We have to really kind of shift the question of saying, well, you know what I mean? It's like, it's what I said before. At which cost I came up here today to talk three minutes with you? How many carbon emissions on the mode of transportation we have get? And this, I mean, I will say, yes, I will go everywhere you want it, but <laughs> reusing plastic bag, picking it up from the bottom of the ocean, generating a community and generating something, what we call, you know, is like the, and I think so is all the rhetoric all the time, you know, Felix Guattari, when he said the three ecology is the environmental ecology, the social ecology, and the mental ecology. And, and, until we don't have an ecological of practice established on this earth, and we can have a certain type of mobility, but not only kind of going somewhere, where we are going, we're not going nowhere. And this means let's really change this overview effect and then build up some excitement of just only like, you know, when, when, when you see this sculpture, lift him up, you see the sun coming up from the horizon and then you float and then it's really you get into the air, it's something which is beautiful, it's silent. There's no explosion. There's no rocking. There is no noise. There is no countdown. You know what I mean? Or countdown. This is, this is a completely different, beautiful. And I think so. It's, it's up to us. And I think so. To build up these narratives, there is another way to be in space. And space, it doesn't start at 100 kilometers. It's here. It's among us. Yes. Let's stop to think about, otherwise it's again the cultural division that nature is outside and you are not part of nature. I mean, it's how much politics and, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, and you know, investment there is to make us belong, not anymore to nature. It's the same. Space is just a geopolitical program to believe that we are not in space. Let's stop it. Maybe just... <laughs> Once, I mean, I totally agree with you. What I said is, uh, general, the way we explore the world we live in. I don't need to go up into space. For example, I'm also very interested in, in space, for example, inside smallness. It doesn't need to be uh, mm. up. You answered it, but maybe answer again from... Uh, I, guess, <laughs> I don't remember what I said, except I was really <laughs> excited by that idea. And, uh, but, and I do think it's a wonderful uh, idea. Uh, for artists to do that. I, I had a very weird job uh, uh, in 2003 to five. I was the first artist in residence at NASA. And um, it was a really bizarre job. I, I should also say I was also the last artist in residence. <laughs> <laughs> and why? Because oh, at one point they were just, they were, Congress was reviewing NASA's budget and they were looking, looking at the same thing going at like, okay, 30, Julian for spy satellites, yes, you know, it's, it's very much about military uh, efforts, as, and, as you know, and, uh, and they went $20,000 for an artist in residence. It was a whistleblower guy, and he's like, this <laughs> <laughs> an outrage. And, and uh, so I am interested in getting that reinstated, not for myself, but it, although it was really wonderful to actually go there, not to just think about it, to go there uh, to dif these different places. Um, and, but I do think it's important to have an artist in residence in NASA. I think it would be important to have an artist in residence in the White House, uh, in Congress, <laughs> artist in residence in the Supreme Court. Uh, artists look at the world differently. You know, we have a different agenda, a very, very different one. So I think that's a good idea. On the other hand, w when some of my friends saw that I wanted to do that trip, one of my friends, I have a tendency to say yes to everything, and she gave me a present. I just realized that I have it with me. It's a pen that looks kind of like a Magritte pipe. It's a, and so when people would say, would you like to do the music for an underwater puppet show? I would go, <laughs> yeah, that sounds really interesting. And, and so she said, you're just going crazy. You're so, you're just say yes to everything. So she gave me this pen which is a no pen, so it has a little button here, so if somebody says, would you like to do an underground, uh, underwater puppet show, you press the button. No! Or <laughs> 20 different kinds no! of things. No, 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 no! <laughs> so, I, I think, uh, like, for me as an artist, I, I really have to think, should I go to the moon or outer space? You know, should I really do that? <laughs> you know, uh, there's lots of things to do here, you know, so. I don't, I, I had to revise my answer about that. Okay. I'm not really sure now whether I would do that or not. You would not. 
Yeah. I don't know. Uh, it would be sure. a hard... Uh, I don't know. It's on one you side, I this. think the experience, nothing can... Uh, um, well, what's the name? To replace. Ex yeah, to yeah. replace the, your own real experience, the being in, in this or another reality. Mm -hmm. So I'm very f for to go for experiences. Mm -hmm. But going to the moon, I, I can't answer. I, I like to go to the moon with my movies, actually. It's a very slow uh, traveling. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's oh, a for me, for me, it's hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Yeah, I'll get on that. <laughs> and, and I actually, I, I, while you were talking, I was thinking about one thing that my wife said in utter exasperation. She said, if we can send a man to the moon, why can't we send them all? <laughs> Sorry, Katie. We need, <laughs> we need men here. We need a few. Uh, yeah. So anyway. this is a question um, that I don't want it to seem too simple, but I want to maybe get at what the stake you and your artistic practices have in, um, in these topics of space exploration. So very simply, how did you come to make work about space? What was the you know, there's many, many things that you could make work about. And what was the kind of, you know, what initiated the project that you um, showed? And I know for many of you, it's a long investment in space. So what was that kind of originary um, impetus? So I don't know, do you want to go? No, one second, because it seems like, a, a, I don't know, there is this, a, 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 there are not so many, but there are a couple of you. John Powell is a good friend. He wrote a book which is called The Other American Space Program. It doesn't seem like because, oh, I fly balloon, it seems you cannot get to space, and I don't want to go to space. Yes, I want, but not with carbon and fossil fuel extraction of this planet, and not destroying this planet because of the addiction that we have to certain economies which are based on fossil fuel. This means I'm not saying like, oh, I don't want to go to the moon and to Mars, but I want to go in a certain way that I think so. First, we have to attune to be on this planet and learn to be on this planet with the people which are here and then see if we can get with certain uh, sustainable way somewhere else. Uh, and this means, now I forgot the question, what was <laughs> Okay, uh, John Powell, uh, the other American space program, this means is a really kind of a three-stage three architecture that you can really get into space uh, with lighter than vehicles. Uh, I mean, when we show a couple of images, he came to the White Sun, we have hold a world record on lifting up a person uh, in the air without burning any fossil fuel with a certified vehicle. We did it a couple of uh, years ago, and then, I don't know if... Uh, it's really like a, a one by one, you know what I mean? If you are interested, just keep thinking and, and can, you know, it's like a, you can float in the air without uh, really having such a complicated Boeing Max 3 that it keeps falling from the air, I think, so at, uh, and nobody knows why. Agnes, how did you um, come in? Actually, I, my interest in space uh, came through the subterranean mm -hmm. because uh, I was investigating subterranean places and I developed, for example, this uh, uh, SGM iceberg probe to investigate subterranean icebergs. And when you look into a deep ice borehole, uh, for example, in Antarctica, 1,000 meter of depth, it's pitch black down there. Only the, from the little probe light, you can see a bit. And then you see the trans more or less transparent ice horizon slowly passing by. And there are some stones uh, frozen inside the clear ice. And it looks like comets passing by. So it's really like in space. And then I got, oh. That's a space travel, and then I started to investigate parallels between uh, deep ice uh, layers or subterranean places and uh, outside Earth, and, and so on. And <laughs> just things develop. Yeah. It's like a rhizome growing <laughs> of projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. Laurie, was it the Louisiana invitation, or was it the NASA residency? Oh, or? that particular uh, uh, VR was. Uh, was an invitation and a, a commission, so uh, they already had the subject. So, uh, but but I would say um, mostly uh, uh, I I'm interested in um, uh, that as just raw energy, what that is. And um, uh, recently I got the flu. I don't know how many of you got this flu. This is a whoa. This is a ten day of flu of like <laughs> partly hallucinations. And one of the things I have to tell you that I saw. I saw the same thing for a couple of days that, like, when my eyes were open as when they were shot. And it was big, organic things going like this, 
raw energy, just chi, just like, and, and the room was not there, but these things were there in a kind of solar system sized place. And they were all moving like, and they were pure energy. And, uh, and so I, I uh, just couldn't imagine, uh, I thought, what? But they have no, they're not differentiated. They don't know that one thing is supposed to be a frog's nose and another is supposed to be your eyelash and another is supposed to be a maple leaf. Where does this information come from? So in this whole fever, I'm just going back and forth, like, how do they know what to do? You know, and it was very, um, so it's probably that that uh, I'm most attracts me to this, but it's also, uh, I, I've written a lot of things about stars and, and one, one of the songs ends, uh, uh, you know, the reason I really love the stars is because we cannot hurt them. We can't blow them up or uh, turn them out or, you know, you know but uh, we are reaching for them. And we are reaching for them. So I think that's, uh, m uh, and especially at the moment, uh, is my, um, uh, fascination with with uh, that as an aspirational thing, I guess. Yeah. And Josh, you spoke a little bit about the planets and. and yeah, I I think um, in the at some point in the early 70s, I became interested in Landsat photos that sent, and it was j interesting looking at the Earth from a different vantage point, which led me to eventually get a pilot's license and spend a lot of time flying and and also to scuba dive, because it's the same feeling. You're, you're, you're in this little world and you're floating above the surface of something, whether it's magical under the ocean or over the earth. And, and I think that, at least in my work, I think it's our job as artists to uh, make people wonder and think about and, and posit what it would be like, and to get them excited about things that Sometimes they pay no attention to, and, and I, I want to say, here, come over here, and look at this. Imagine yourself mm -hmm. an astronaut floating in orbit somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been a lot of techno-euphoric talk in the earlier panels, and I think what, um, what interests me about the work as you've described it is there's a deep investment in the materials that you're, I mean, you have your training you know, crew in the, in the country. And with Tomas, the work is really invested in how to think solar energy as, as an available resource to us without having to rely on fossil fuels. With Lori's work, it's like trying to get into VR as some way to unfold experience differently, like as the kind of material reality of how disembodied one feels in that, and then to kind of imagine that projective space as a speculation into futures. And with Josh, is to imagine this kind of visual material relationship that glass has to the kind of molten qualities of the earth itself. It's a very self-reflexive position, you know, to be in as a glass blower, to, to kind of think yourself as, you know, <laughs> sort of maker of worlds, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we, I just see zero there. So we are out of time, but we want, I wanted to have some time for questions, which I hope we have a few minutes for. So, um, so does anyone have any questions for them? Okay, I think there's that odd, tissue box or whatever it is. <laughs> you can there we go. Yeah. Heads up. <laughs> ah. oh. <laughs> that head was up. <laughs> uh, thank you so much all of you for your your presentation and your ideas. I feel like some, that could be a question for any of you or all of you. Sorry if I'm not in the light or something. Mm -hmm. um, how do other species, the perception that other species might have of space or their Umwelt in general, might help us ask the questions about space or answer them differently? How does what? What is the question? Uh, um, um, other species. Oh, oh other species. Other, how, the, way other, the way other animals see the world. Huh? How can that mm. help us ask the questions about space in a different way? Mm -hmm. nice. Feels like you're touching with a goose, maybe some <laughs> of your work with the spiders, a lot of your past work maybe with music and animals, and also all the creatures that you're creating. So. Mm -hmm. 
So post-humanism in space. <laughs> How do we kind of think differently about access, I imagine, you know? Like, what does it mean to, for us to strive? No, no, I was thinking just like a, um, because spiders also do a method which is called ballooning, is the way how also they migrate. And then something which is very beautiful also in relationship with the movements and, and the idea to moving is something which is called stillness in motion. And this means just a little bit, I will go back to the human, but then also let's try to remember how the spider, it kind of ride uh, these kind of rivers of the wind. This means if we will build kind of in a, in a solar balloon, uh, let's put it that way, there have been only four humans in history of humanity who have lifted up from the air without burning any fossil fuel, eh? without using hydrogen. hydrogen. This means these are the real heroes for me. Let's re put it that way. The astronauts, I love them, but are from their, their epoch. And it's been the one who can lift up without a burning is good. Now, when you are in this kind of solar balloon and you do have, sometimes the journeys have been very, very short, a couple of, of kilometers, this means you just, the sun come up, you rise with the balloon because the hot air is there. If I will be talking with Eva and I look at her hair right here, it does not move one millimeter. Now you watch 10 meters down the ground and the trees are shaking like crazy. And I look at her and her move, the hair doesn't move. You move with the wind. There is no more friction anymore. This will not experience a sailing boat in any other mode. And this means that maybe is an overview effect. It's like becoming the wind, not moving the wind. You move with the wind. And this means your brain you really gets confused. It's like because I see her hair, it doesn't move. And I watch down the trees and it's gone. This means you move with the wind and you become the wind. And the balloon is your question. <laughs> It's such a great question. It's because, you know, we ship like out and spiders and just use them as kind of a, instead of really studying how they actually communicate with each other, which would, uh, we would learn an awful lot more about how we might approach uh, communication uh, and... Uh, I have two cats that don't seem to care that much about art. <laughs> <laughs> they do like things that roll, like my planets. And <laughs> Yeah, but it's, I mean, of course it's very enriching, but it's a question of communication. And uh, I have spent so much time with my Moongies. They have their own communication structures, and I, uh, it's a process to find ways how to communicate with each other. I mean, we have set up, uh, we have developed some communication devices for the geese. So uh, they have their own control room and they can send us Morse code data about their general well being and, and <laughs> about their experiments. But it's still, uh, it's, it's really um, a challenge to communicate with a total other species. I don't know uh, if you... But, um, for example, until now, I didn't find the key to initiate um, uh, um, takeoff when I want. Let's say, okay, now, okay, let's take off and fly. Uh, but it happens that uh, uh, one goose, you hear a signal, and then they take off and fly from one mountain to another. But I didn't find the key yet. So it's, <laughs> it's a question of communication methods to develop a common language or never. I don't know if it's possible at all. Mm. Uh. The question there? Oh, no more. OK, sorry, we're out of time. But thank you all so much. And thank, thank you. you. <laughs>